Today we're going to share an unbelievable and transformative story. Imagine experiencing death, entering a hidden golden city, and returning with a revelation that could change the future of humanity. This is exactly what happened to Lorelai Danforth, and her experience leaves us with a powerful message about what is to come in 2024. If you are not yet subscribed to the channel, take the opportunity to subscribe now and activate the bell so you don't miss any of our content on spirituality, mysteries, and revelations. Like the video, because this story will leave you speechless. Hello, my name is Lorelai Danforth. I'm a woman like any other, 45 years old, born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina. I have a pretty ordinary life. I work as a secretary at a law firm. I've been married to John for 20 years, and we have two teenage children. I like gardening, reading novels in my free time, and spending Sundays with my family. Nothing about me suggests that I would be the kind of person to go through something extraordinary. But life has these things, doesn't it? Sometimes, when we least expect it, something happens that completely changes our perception of the world. That's exactly what happened to me on April 21st, 1999. That day, I had what doctors call a near-death experience, or NDE. And I can say, without a shadow of a doubt, that it was the most memorable and transformative event of my life. Before I tell you what happened, I need to explain that I was pregnant at the time, almost seven months. It was my third pregnancy, and like the other two, it was a little complicated due to my diabetes. I had to constantly monitor my blood sugar levels and take insulin regularly. It wasn't easy, but I was used to it. After all, I had been dealing with diabetes since I was a teenager. That April morning, I woke up feeling a little strange. It wasn't anything specific, you know? Just a feeling that something wasn't right. But, as I have always done in life, I decided to move on. I had some shopping to do at Kmart, so I got ready and left. The day was warm, typical of spring in Charleston. The sun was shining brightly and the air was a little stuffy. As I drove to the store, that strange feeling kept bothering me. I even thought about going back home, but decided it was stupid of me. It must just be the heat, I thought to myself. Little did I know that that decision to continue with my plans would change the course of my life forever. I went into Kmart and started doing my shopping. The place was busy, as always, with people rushing from one place to another. As I walked through the halls, I started to feel weaker and weaker. My belly felt heavier than usual, and my steps were getting slower. I stopped in a hallway and tested my sugar level. It was normal. I was confused if it wasn't diabetes, what could it be? What? It was at that moment that I knew something really wasn't right. It was as if a voice inside me was screaming that I needed help. I left my shopping cart in the middle of the hallway and headed to the reception desk. The attendant looked at me with concern as I said, Please call an ambulance, I think I'm going to die. Little did I know that those words were truer than I could have imagined at that moment. What happened next would forever change my understanding of life, death, and everything that exists beyond what we can see. The Kmart receptionist looked at me with a mixture of surprise and concern. She tried to calm me down, saying I would be fine, but I knew that wasn't true. There was something happening inside me, something that was beyond my understanding at the time. The ambulance arrived quickly. I remember climbing onto the stretcher on my own, even though my body was getting weaker and weaker. The paramedics began checking my vitals, asking questions about my condition. I explained about the pregnancy and diabetes, but all the tests they did seemed normal. Inside the ambulance, the silence was oppressive. I could hear the sound of the siren in the distance as if it were submerged in water. My thoughts were confused, and I felt like I was floating. It was a strange sensation, as if my body and mind were slowly disconnecting. We arrived at the emergency room and I was transferred to a hospital stretcher. It was at that moment that everything changed drastically. Suddenly I felt an immense emptiness inside me, as if something was being ripped out of my being. The voices of the doctors and nurses seemed distant, echoing as if they were at the end of a long tunnel. I heard someone say, She went into ventricular fibrillation. I didn't understand the meaning of those words at that moment, but I felt they were serious. 
My vision began to darken around the edges, as if a black veil was being pulled over my eyes. And then, in an instant, everything went dark. I can't say how long I stayed in that darkness. It could have been seconds or an eternity. There was no sense of time. There was no fear. There was no pain. It was as if I had been wrapped in a soft, warm blanket, protected from all the chaos that was happening to my physical body. Suddenly, the darkness began to dissipate. It was as if I was emerging from a deep sleep. But instead of waking up in the hospital, I found myself in a completely different place. A place of such indescribable beauty that human words seem inadequate to describe it. I was standing on a street made of something that looked like liquid gold. The ground beneath my bare feet was warm and comfortable, emitting a soft glow. The air around me was pure, cleaner, and more invigorating than anything I had ever experienced on Earth. I looked around me and saw magnificent structures, buildings that seemed to be made of pure light. They stood majestically, their fluid, elegant forms defying the laws of architecture I knew. Each building seemed to radiate its own energy, pulsing with life. I began to walk, my bare feet gently touching the golden floor. There was no rush. There was no worry. For the first time in a long time, perhaps for the first time in my life, I felt completely at peace. As I walked, I realized I wasn't alone. There were other people, or were they souls, moving around me. They seemed to be made of the same soft light that made up the buildings. Their faces were serene, filled with a wisdom and understanding that went beyond anything I had ever seen. It was then that I saw him. A being of pure light walked towards me. He didn't have a defined shape, but his presence was powerful and comforting at the same time. I felt a deep reverence, as if I were in the presence of something truly divine. The being of light approached me and, without using words, made me understand where I was. This is the Golden City, he told me, his voice echoing directly in my mind. A place that exists both here and on Earth, although it has not yet been discovered there. I wanted to ask a thousand questions, understand everything about this wonderful place, but something told me that my time there was limited. The being of light continued to guide me, showing me wonders that defied my understanding. As we progressed, I felt a growing connection to everything around me. It was as if every particle of my being was in perfect harmony with the universe. I felt part of something much bigger, something infinitely beautiful and meaningful. It was in this moment of deep connection that I heard a familiar voice calling me. It was the voice of my unborn daughter. My heart was filled with indescribable joy. I knew she was there, somewhere in that kingdom of light, waiting for the right moment to come into the world. But before I could go to meet her, I felt a force pulling me back. The voice of the being of light echoed one last time in my mind. It is not your time yet, Lorelei. You have more to do. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, my journey in the Golden City came to an end. I felt myself being pulled back, crossing dimensions, returning to my physical body that was fighting for life in a hospital bed. Opening my eyes back in the hospital was like emerging from a deep dream. The fluorescent light was harsh and artificial compared to the soft glow of the Golden City. I felt a tube in my throat and heard the constant beeping of machines around me. My body felt heavy and clumsy, as if I had forgotten how to inhabit it. I saw my mother and sister at the bedside, their faces etched with fear and exhaustion. When they realized I was awake, their eyes filled with tears of relief. I tried to speak, but the breathing tube stopped me. A nurse quickly entered the room, called by my increased heart rate. In the days that followed, I was informed about what had happened. My heart had stopped for more than four minutes. Doctors fought to bring me back, administering electric shocks and performing chest compressions. By all medical bills, I should be dead or, at best, severely brain damaged. But there I was, alive and lucid. Unfortunately, it wasn't all good news. The stress of the event had been too much for my baby. She didn't survive. The pain of this loss was deep, 
but somehow I knew she was okay. I had felt it in the Golden City, and that memory brought me comfort. My body had also suffered. The doctors explained to me that I would need triple bypass surgery. My heart was damaged and needed extensive repairs. But surprisingly, I didn't feel afraid. After what I had experienced, the idea of death no longer scared me. Recovery was slow and difficult. I spent weeks in the hospital, fighting to regain my strength. Each day brought new challenges, learning to breathe without assistance again, taking the first steps after surgery, dealing with constant pain. But there was something different about me now, an inner strength I never knew I possessed. During this time I tried to tell people about my experience. I spoke about the golden city, about the being of light, about the peace I had felt. Some people listened with fascination, others with skepticism. Doctors talked about hallucinations caused by a lack of oxygen to the brain. But I knew the truth. What I had experienced was real, more real than anything I had ever experienced. Months passed, and I was finally released from the hospital. Returning home was a relief, but also a challenge. The world looked different now. The colors seemed more vivid, the sounds clearer. I found myself looking up at the sky often, remembering the glow of the golden city. Adapting to normal life was difficult. Sometimes I cried for no apparent reason, feeling a deep longing for that place of peace I had known. The sunlight bothered me, seeming pale in comparison to the light I had experienced on the other side. My doctor explained to me that many people who have near-death experiences report similar feelings. He called it NDE survivor syndrome. But I knew it was more than that. I had fundamentally changed. My perspective on life, death, and the purpose of existence had been completely transformed. I knew there was a reason I came back, a mission I still needed to accomplish. And so, I began my journey of rediscovery, trying to understand my new place in the world, carrying with me the memory of that extraordinary experience and the certainty that there was much more to existence than meets the eye. The months following my near-death experience were a time of profound transformation. It was like I was seeing the world through a completely new lens. Things that had once seemed so important, money, status, material possessions, now seemed insignificant compared to what I had experienced. My relationship with my family has changed. I became more patient, more understanding. The small irritations of everyday life no longer affected me as they used to. I spent more time with my children, really listening to what they had to say, marveling at the wisdom that often came out of their young mouths. My husband, John, had a hard time understanding the change in me at first. He was happy I was alive, of course, but the woman who came home from the hospital wasn't exactly the same woman he'd known for twenty years. We had many long, in-depth conversations, often late into the night, as I tried to explain what had happened to me. Over time, he began to understand and even embrace this new version of me. At work, things have also changed. I continued as a secretary at the law firm, but my approach was different. I began to see each interaction as an opportunity to bring a little more light into the world. Whether it was a kind smile to a stressed customer or a word of encouragement to an overwhelmed colleague, I tried to incorporate some of that peace I had experienced in the Golden City into every moment of my day. But not everything was easy. There were days when the longing for that place of light was almost unbearable. I found myself looking out the window, remembering the glow of the golden streets, the purity of the air, the feeling of complete harmony I had experienced. In those moments, the world around me seemed opaque, almost unreal in comparison. I started reaching out to other people who had similar experiences. I read books about NDEs, joined online support groups, and even attended some talks on the subject. It was comforting to know that I wasn't alone, that there were others who understood what I was going through. One of the hardest things to deal with was some people's skepticism. Friends and family, even well-meaning ones, often dismissed my experience as a hallucination or a lived dream. It was just your brain reacting to the lack of oxygen, some said. Others suggested it was a side effect of the medication. As much as these reactions hurt me, I understood. 
After all, if someone had told me a story like this before my own experience, I probably would have reacted the same way. But I knew the truth. What I had experienced was more real than anything I had ever experienced. The clarity, the vividness, the depth of that experience was etched into my soul in a way that no dream or hallucination could replicate. Over time, I learned to keep the deeper details of my experience to myself, sharing them only with those who demonstrated a genuine openness to listen. It wasn't out of shame or fear, but out of respect for the sacred nature of what had happened to me. One of the most significant changes was my relationship with death. The fear that once consumed me was completely gone. I knew now that death was not the end, but rather a transition to something beautiful and beyond our earthly understanding. This didn't mean I was eager to die, far from it. I had been sent back for a reason and I was determined to fulfill whatever my purpose here was. This new perspective on death allowed me to better cope with the loss of my unborn daughter. Although the pain was still there, there was also a sense of peace. I had felt her in the Golden City, and I knew she was fine, waiting for the right moment to come into the world. As the months turned into years, I learned to integrate my experience into my everyday life. It was no longer something that defined every moment of my day, but a precious part of who I was, a source of strength and wisdom that I could turn to in difficult times. And there was one thing I never forgot. The words of the being of light about the golden city also existing on earth, in a place not yet discovered. This information sat in the back of my mind, a promise that there was more to be revealed, more to be discovered. I didn't know when or how this would happen, but I was sure that one day, this truth would come to light. As the years passed, my near-death experience continued to shape my life in profound and unexpected ways. One of the most notable changes was my perception of time. Before, I was constantly in a rush, always running from one task to another, worried about deadlines and commitments. Now, I had learned to value every moment. I started waking up earlier to watch the sunrise. Something about the way the golden light spread across the sky reminded me of the city I had visited. In those quiet moments of the morning, I felt closer to that transcendental experience. My relationship with nature has also changed drastically. I began to notice details that had previously gone unnoticed. The intricate pattern of leaves on a tree, the buzzing of bees in a field of flowers, the twinkling of stars on a clear night. Each of these elements seemed to contain an echo of that perfect harmony that I had experienced in the Golden City. I began meditating regularly, seeking to reconnect with that sense of peace and unity I had experienced. At first it was frustrating. My mind constantly wandered, and I found myself longing for that immediate, deep connection I had felt on the other side. But with time and practice, I learned to find moments of stillness and clarity. My diet and lifestyle have also undergone significant changes. I started eating healthier, preferring natural and whole foods. I started practicing yoga and taking regular walks in nature. These changes were not motivated by vanity or concern about appearance, but by a deep respect for the miracle that is the human body, something I had learned to value even more after my experience of almost losing mine. One of the most profound transformations occurred in the way I related to others. Before, I tended to judge quickly, to get irritated by people's flaws and weaknesses. Now I saw each person as a soul on a journey, just like me. I began to approach each interaction with more compassion and empathy. That didn't mean I would never get frustrated or upset again. After all, I was still human, with all the complexities and contradictions that that implies. But now, when I caught myself judging someone, I remembered the light I had seen in every soul in the Golden City. This helped me find patience and understanding, even in the most challenging situations. My perspective on success and personal fulfillment has also changed dramatically. Before, I measured my worth by traditional standards of success, job promotions, material acquisitions, social status. Now I understood that true success was in living with love, in making a difference in the lives of others, no matter how small. I started volunteering at a local homeless shelter. Each Saturday, I spent a few hours serving meals and talking to people who came looking for help. 
Often, just hearing their stories, offering a kind smile or a word of encouragement made all the difference. These moments of genuine human connection made me feel more alive and fulfilled than any professional achievement ever had. At the same time, I struggled with a greater sense of purpose. The words of the being of light about the golden city on earth continued to echo in my mind. I felt like I had been entrusted with important knowledge, but I didn't know exactly what to do with it. Should I share my experience widely, actively seek out this hidden city, or simply wait, trusting that the purpose of this information would reveal itself at the right time? These questions kept me awake many nights. I would talk to John about it, and he would listen patiently, offering his support even when he didn't fully understand. You came back for a reason, he would tell me. Trust this. The path will reveal itself when the time is right. And so I continued my journey, navigating this new life with one foot in the everyday world and the other in something beyond. Each day brought new challenges and discoveries as I learned to integrate my extraordinary experience with the demands of ordinary life. But I knew one thing for sure. My near-death experience had not been the end of one journey, but the beginning of another. A journey of self-discovery, of searching for meaning, and of a deep desire to bring some of that light I had experienced into the world around me. As the years passed, I discovered that living with the knowledge of such a profound experience brought its own unique challenges. There were times when I felt torn between two worlds. The physical world around me, with its everyday demands and responsibilities, and the spiritual world I had glimpsed, with its promise of eternal peace and harmony. One of the biggest challenges was maintaining balance. It was easy to become so absorbed in memories and reflections on my experience that I was in danger of disconnecting from the world around me. I had to learn to be present in the here and now, even while carrying the memory of that other place with me. There were days when mundane reality seemed almost unbearably heavy compared to the lightness I had experienced in the Golden City. In those moments I found myself longing for that feeling of peace and total connection. It was as if I were in exile, forced to live in a world that was no longer my true home. But over time, I learned to see these moments of longing not as a curse, but as a reminder. A reminder that there was something beyond this life, something beautiful and meaningful waiting for us all. It gave me strength to face everyday challenges and inspiration to try to bring some of that light to the world around me. Another significant challenge was dealing with people's expectations. Those who knew about my experience often looked at me differently. Some expected me to have all the answers, as if my brief journey to the other side had transformed me into some kind of spiritual guru. Others seemed to expect me to live a life of perfect holiness, free from human failings or weaknesses. The truth is that I was still human, with all the imperfections and struggles that entails. I had bad days. I got irritated in traffic. I argued with my husband. Every time I failed to live up to these unrealistic expectations, I felt a pang of guilt. It was as if I was disappointing not only the people around me, but also the being of light who had sent me back. Over time, I learned to be kinder to myself. I understood that my experience did not make me perfect or superior, but rather gave me a greater responsibility to try to live with more love and compassion. And that included having compassion for myself and my own flaws. One of the most challenging aspects was trying to communicate my experience to others. Words seemed inadequate to describe the depth and beauty of what I had experienced. How to explain the colors of the rainbow to a blind person? How can you describe to someone who has never heard music the beauty of a symphony? Often when I tried to share my experience, I was met with skepticism or even mockery. Some people accused me of seeking attention or making up the whole story. That hurt, of course. But I learned not to let the opinions of others diminish the truth of my experience. At the same time, I found people who were genuinely interested and open to what I had to share. These encounters were precious to me. Seeing someone's eyes light up with understanding, or hearing someone say that my story had brought comfort or hope, reminded me of why I had been sent back. One of the biggest challenges was dealing with knowledge about the Golden City on Earth. The light being's words about this being hidden but about to be revealed weighed on my mind. 
I constantly asked myself if I should be doing more to discover or publicize this information. John, my husband, was supportive but also worried. Don't let it consume you, he would tell me gently. If it is to be revealed, it will be at the right time. He was right, of course. I learned that my role was not to force the revelation of this knowledge, but rather to be prepared for when the moment arrived. This meant working on myself, growing spiritually, and being open to the opportunities that life presented me. Over the years I realized that my personal growth was perhaps the most important aspect of my post-NDE journey. Every challenge, every moment of doubt or frustration, was an opportunity for learning and evolution. I learned to find balance between the spiritual and material worlds. I learned to be compassionate towards myself and others. I learned to trust the timing of the universe, even when I didn't fully understand the bigger plan. And most of all, I learned that the true light I had experienced in the Golden City was not in a distant, inaccessible place. It was inside me, inside every person, waiting to be recognized and shared. This understanding brought deep peace. It didn't matter what the future held, or when, and if, the golden city on earth would be revealed. What mattered was how I lived each day, how I treated each person who crossed my path, how I spread a little of that light in each interaction. And so, I continued my journey, grateful for the experience that had changed my life, but equally grateful for the challenges that helped me grow. Every day was a new opportunity to learn, to love, to live fully, not just for me, but for all those I had left behind in that city of light, and for all those who had not yet experienced its beauty. As the years passed, I discovered that my near-death experience had connected me to a world much larger than I had ever imagined. Although I chose to live a relatively low-key life, not seeking public attention for my story, I occasionally met people who had gone through similar experiences. These connections often happened in unexpected and informal ways. Sometimes it was during a casual conversation with a neighbor or a co-worker. Other times it was through a friend of a friend who had heard about my experience and wanted to share their own. I particularly remember one woman, Sarah, who I met at a parent meeting at my children's school. She had lost her daughter in a car accident a few years earlier and was struggling to find meaning in life. When somehow the subject of near-death experiences came up, I saw his eyes light up with interest. I shared with her a little about my experience, about the feeling of peace and love I had felt, about the certainty I had that death was not the end. I saw tears in her eyes as she listened to me, and later she told me about a similar experience she had shortly after her daughter's accident an experience she had never shared with anyone for fear of not being believed. In the months that followed, Sarah and I became close friends. I watched as she went from deep pain to serene acceptance, and finally to a new appreciation for life. Your words gave me hope when I had none, she told me one day. Now I know that my daughter is in a beautiful place, and that one day we will meet again. These connections constantly reminded me of why I had been sent back. Every person I could comfort or inspire was confirmation that my experience had a greater purpose. But not all connections were easy or positive. There were people who tried to use my story for their own ends, twisting my words or trying to recruit me for their own spiritual or religious agendas. I received invitations to join cults and sects, promises that I could channel my experience for financial gain and even threats from people who believed I was spreading heresy. These negative experiences taught me to be more cautious about who and how I shared my story with. I learned to trust my instincts and set clear limits. I wasn't interested in fame or fortune, or becoming a cult figure. My only desire was to share the hope and comfort my experience had given me, and only with those who were truly open to listen. One of the most meaningful connections I made was with a small informal support group for people who have had NDEs. We met once a month at one of the members' homes, sharing our experiences and supporting each other as we navigated the challenges of living with this extraordinary knowledge. It was in this group that I met Marcus, a former military man who had had a similar experience to me during a mission abroad. Marcus and I became close friends, exchanging emails almost daily. We shared our struggles with integrating our experiences into everyday life, 
our frustrations with those who didn't understand, and our moments of joy when we felt that connection to something greater. These friendships and connections have become a source of strength and comfort for me. They were constant reminders that I was not alone on this journey, that there were others who understood what I had experienced and the impact it had on my daily life. As time went on, I noticed a subtle change in how people reacted when I shared my story. There seemed to be a growing openness to these experiences, a greater willingness to consider possibilities beyond the material world we could see and touch. I didn't know if this was the result of a change in society at large, or if it was simply that I had become better at discerning who to share my story with. Either way, it was encouraging. It gave me hope that perhaps the world was slowly preparing itself for the revelations that were to come. Meanwhile, I continued living my life as normally as possible. I worked, took care of my family, got involved in community activities. But there was always that underlying awareness, that expectation that something bigger was on the horizon. And so, day after day, year after year, I continued my journey. Living between two worlds, carrying the knowledge of the golden city in my heart, waiting for the day when this truth would be revealed to everyone. I didn't know when or how it would happen, but I had faith that when the time came I would be ready. As the years passed after my near-death experience, I discovered that life is a constant balance between revelations and mysteries. Some questions were answered, others arose. Some doors closed, others opened. One of the most profound revelations came in an unexpected way. I was shopping at the local supermarket, a mundane task I used to undertake without much thought, when suddenly I was hit by a wave of deja vu so strong that I had to brace myself against the trolley to keep from falling. For a brief moment, the supermarket aisle disappeared and I found myself back in the Golden City. But this time, something was different. I could see the people around me, not as ethereal forms of light, but as they were here on Earth. They were doing ordinary things, choosing fruit, comparing prices, talking about dinner. And then, in the blink of an eye, the vision disappeared. I was back in the regular supermarket with its fluorescent lights and ambient music. But something had changed inside me. I realized with a clarity that left me breathless that the Golden City was not just a distant place, separated from our reality. It was a dimension that coexisted with our own, a higher reality that permeated every aspect of our everyday lives. This revelation profoundly changed the way I saw the world around me. Every interaction, every seemingly mundane moment, became an opportunity to glimpse this higher reality. I began to see glimpses of the golden city everywhere, in a stranger's smile, in a child's laugh, in the kindness of a neighbor. At the same time, this revelation brought with it new mysteries. If the golden city was so close, why couldn't we see it all the time? What was stopping us from accessing this higher reality in our daily lives? These questions led me to explore various spiritual and philosophical practices. I began meditating regularly, seeking that sense of connection I had experienced in the Golden City. I studied ancient texts from different traditions, looking for clues about how to navigate between worlds. One night, during a particularly deep meditation session, I had another powerful vision. I saw Earth from space, shining like a blue and green jewel. As I got closer, I could see lines of golden energy crisscrossing the planet, forming an intricate network. These lines seemed to pulse with a life of their own, connecting all living things in a complex and beautiful pattern. When the vision dissipated, I marveled at what I had seen. Could this energy network be the physical manifestation of the golden city on Earth? Were these lines the paths that connected us to this higher reality? I shared this vision with John, who listened patiently as he always did. He suggested that I research ancient beliefs in earth energy lines, such as ley lines in Europe or the song lines of the Australian Aborigines. I was surprised to discover how many ancient cultures had similar concepts. This discovery led me to a new phase of personal exploration. I started paying more attention to the places that made me feel more connected to the energy I had experienced in the Golden City. Sometimes it was a spot in nature, a waterfall hidden in the nearby forest, or a peaceful beach at sunset. Other times it was an unexpected place like an old church in the center of town, or a small community garden. 
During these explorations, I began to notice patterns and synchronicities in my everyday life. Chance encounters that seemed charged with meaning, vivid dreams that seemed to contain important messages, moments of sudden clarity that came out of nowhere. One of the most memorable experiences occurred during a walk in a local park that I had frequented for years. It was an ordinary autumn day, the leaves starting to change color. Suddenly I felt a subtle change in the atmosphere. The air seemed to vibrate with a familiar energy. For a moment, I had the dizzying sensation of being in two places at once, with my feet firmly planted on the grass of the park, but my spirit soaring in the golden streets of the celestial city. The experience was brief but intense. When I came to, I was panting and with tears in my eyes. I looked around and noticed that the park seemed different somehow. The colors more vibrant, the sounds clearer, as if a veil had been momentarily lifted. This experience reinforced my belief that the Golden City was not just a metaphor or a distant place, but a tangible reality that sometimes manifested itself in our world. But it also raised new questions. Why did some places seem more prone to these demonstrations? What made certain people more sensitive to these energies? I returned home with more questions than answers, but also with a renewed sense of purpose. I began keeping a detailed diary of my experiences and observations, hoping that one day these records might help unravel the mystery of the Golden City. As time passed, I noticed subtle changes in myself. I became more sensitive to the energies around me, more in tune with the nuances of human interactions. I began to have insights and intuitions that often proved surprisingly accurate. John noticed these changes in me. One night, as we were sitting on our porch watching the stars, he took my hand. You look different, he said softly. More present somehow, like he's seeing things the rest of us don't. I smiled, grateful for his understanding. Sometimes I feel like I'm living in two worlds at once, I confessed. The world everyone sees, and another world just beneath the surface full of light and possibilities. John nodded thoughtfully. Do you think that one day we will all be able to see this other world? I hope so, I replied. In fact, I believe this is what we are heading towards. The revelation of the Golden City. I think it will not just be the discovery of a physical place. It will be a collective awakening, a change in the way we perceive reality. As we talked, I felt that familiar sense of anticipation rising within me. Something was coming, I could feel it. The world was changing, slowly but surely. And somehow, I knew that my near-death experience and everything I had learned since would be important when the moment of revelation finally arrived. But for now, my task was to keep living, observing, learning. Each day brought new discoveries, new mysteries to contemplate. And in every moment, I carried with me the memory of the Golden City, a beacon of hope and promise for the future. As the years passed, I began to notice a subtle but undeniable change in the world around me. It wasn't something I could pinpoint, but it was as if a collective consciousness was slowly awakening. People everywhere and from all walks of life seemed to be more open to ideas and experiences that they would previously have dismissed as fanciful or impossible. I've seen it in small things, like the rise in popularity of meditation and mindfulness, and in bigger things like the growing interest in near-death experiences and other unexplained phenomena. In my work as a secretary at the law firm, I noticed that even the most skeptical and pragmatic lawyers started talking about work-life balance, about the importance of mental and spiritual well-being. Clients came in talking about mystical experiences or powerful intuitions that had influenced their business decisions. In the local community, I saw an increase in interest in holistic health practices, in organic and sustainable agriculture, in alternative forms of education that emphasized the holistic development of the child. It was as if people were rediscovering an ancient wisdom, a connection to nature and the universe that had been forgotten. My support group for people who have had NDEs has gradually grown over the years. What started as a small circle of five or six people has expanded to more than twenty. Each new member brought their own unique story, 
their own perspective on what they had experienced on the other side. And although the details varied, there were common themes that came up again and again. Light, unconditional love, a feeling of connection to everything. One night during one of our meetings, a new member of the group, a young artist named Mia, shared something fascinating. She said that since she was a child, she saw the world in a different way. I could see auras around people and objects, and sometimes I saw patterns of light and color in the air that no one else seemed to notice. As Mia spoke, I felt a shiver run down my spine. His descriptions of the patterns of light and color were incredibly similar to what I had seen in the Golden City. Could Mia somehow constantly see what I had only briefly glimpsed? This possibility opened a new world of speculation. What if there were people among us who could naturally perceive these higher realities? What if, instead of being a rare and extraordinary experience, the perception of the Golden City was something we could all learn to access? I started researching more about synesthesia, extrasensory perception, and other phenomena related to expanded consciousness. I discovered that there were more people like Mia than I realized, individuals who reported unusual sensory experiences that seemed to transcend our normal physical reality. As I approached 60, I felt a growing sense of urgency. The date mentioned by the Being of Light, September 19th, 2024, was approaching. I didn't know exactly what to expect, but I had a strong intuition that it would be a significant turning point. I started to notice more synchronicities in my daily life. Repeating numbers appeared everywhere. On clock times, on license plates, on shopping receipts. Casual encounters led to deep, meaningful conversations. Books fell from the shelves, opening to pages that seemed to contain exactly the information I needed at that moment. And I knew, with a certainty that came from the depths of my soul, that my journey was not over. In fact, it was just beginning. The Golden City had revealed itself, and now it was up to us, all of us, to learn to live in this new reality, to bring a little of that light and love into every aspect of our lives. The future was full of endless possibilities and I couldn't wait to see what came next.